Well, hello, and welcome back to another episode of Accountants of Sexy Change My Mind. Today we have a lovely, lovely accountant from across the pond. And um, if you've noticed the title of this episode, it's called The Public Apology, because I have met Andrew van der Beek, van der Beek, van der Beek, van der Beek, Beek. Beek. Beek, before. Yes, van, van der Beek, if you want to really roll it out. <laughs> That's so Dutch. <laughs> Um, I have met him before, but I did call him Peter at Countex because I thought he was Peter Marlow. So first of all, before, without any other things going on, I'm so sorry for that. And welcome to the show. Um, thank you. Uh, I mean, it, you weren't the only person on that day that actually mistook me for someone else, which I found uh, quite hilarious. I had two people um, come up to me. And I th- I'm not sure if it was looking for Peter at the same time, the other one, but it was yeah. like, oh, you have a beard. And you're yeah. in an account conference. You must be the only one of us that has a beard. So hello, Peter. Yeah. So it was, um, it was always a pleasant way to get to know someone by accident, hey? It was, it was a really lovely conversation, actually, after that. I found out mm. you were there. Your mum was there watching, and she was super excited oh, yeah, to she be was. there. She loved it. It was good fun. Yeah. So it was a really nice um, accidental conversation. So well done, Peter, for being ginger with a beard, because, you know, it opens up opportunities. Got to love that. He's easily opened the door for the rest of us. Much appreciated. <laughs> Bless him. Right. So that's not the reason you're on the show, though. I did want to apologise, and I wanted to bring that to attention because I, I thought that was it. Still. I thought you just the apology, and that's it. Oh, We're yeah. done. Right. Just a quick, just a quick two minute. Yeah. Okay. Right. Anyway. <laughs> 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 but you, I, I love you. I don't think you know because I'm across the pond and I watch like not deep love, not like children love. But like admiration is in professional love. Let's just clear that up right now. That's okay. I I, I appreciate the love. Um, I respect the love. I'm a I'm I'm a lover, not a fighter. Let's You're be honest. A lo- exactly, exactly. But you have a super ethos. Like I love what you do. I love how you explain things, and you've got a really interesting journey as well. So I wanted to bring you on the show because if they haven't heard of you, they need to hear from you. Um, you are a founder of Purpose. Let me just start there. That's mm. one of your job titles, founder of purpose, head of human connectivity. Mm. Like, I love those as job titles. Why? Who? Like, explain to the audience, who are you and why are you them? Yeah, I mean, I reckon I keep trying to figure out how to explain myself better every time someone says, who Who are you? And, yeah. and why on earth should we talk to you? I guess, I mean, for all intents and purposes, I'm just an ordinary Australian bloke living on the Mornington Peninsula, about an hour south of Melbourne. Um, I grew up in a relatively average home. We weren't well off by any means of the standard. Um, and towards the end of high school, I decided that problem solving and numbers were things I was good at. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go do accounting. And then, you know, fast forward, not quite 20 years, I'm 37. So it's my 20th, uh, next year will be my 20th year in the profession. Um, I, I run a business called Illuminate, uh, which is an accounting business, an accounting firm, bookkeeping firm, um, kind of technology consulting in the accounting space. And, and I've spent, I guess, the last 12 years trying to be authentic and trying to be impactful and trying to be purpose-led and trying to ensure that the actions that I take have a, a positive impact on those around me when it comes to the skill set that I have. Uh, and that skill set is obviously at a core, a tax and accounting background, you know, run an accounting firm with 20 odd kind of teams servicing a, a large number of business clients in Australia and, and around the world. But but more importantly, I guess I'm incredibly passionate about creating exceptional experiences and making people feel welcomed and comfortable yeah. for who they are in that environment. And so I take that into accounting and I do it that way with how we ha- we build relationships like like illuminate was founded on the idea of we don't want to be transactional we want to be relational so how can we be more relational and then yeah. purpose and that kind of stuff comes through so you know the head of purpose that kind of role at illuminate is really what it connects to like my 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 job is to ensure that illuminate has purpose um that our team are aware of that purpose that our clients feel the outcome and the output of said purpose and we operate that and then the head of human connectivity was um, is a, a, another business that I kind of have involved in. With me and a couple of the guys at Illuminate purchased a, a large factory and we we converted it into a co working space, of which mm. is where Illuminate's headquarters are. And and the idea of like 
connecting humans together and how do we yeah. provide an environment where you know in our space it's at a, at a co-working space but this actually idea started many years beforehand which was um i gathered six other accounting business owners and i i got them to like meet me at an airport or whatever i chucked them in the back of the car and we drove out to like the middle of nowhere in victoria if you've ever heard of a, 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 a an australian character by the way of ned kelly yeah. um who's a yeah. very notorious um kind of outlaw who people love at the same time we went to beechworth with beechworth which is where he's from and we spent a few days just connecting and exploring what it means to be ourselves in our industry and supporting each other in that kind of space mm. and then that was the idea of we want to connect people like that it was like let's take them out of their comfort to put them in their yeah. zone and then it's evolved now to a, a co-working space so i don't know like it's i just love like your greatest strength is your greatest weakness right so i love people so incredibly yeah. much almost to a fault where like i care too much about people and people impact me more than they should but that's probably why you know words like purpose and human connectivity and authenticity and and you know that kind of stuff are, are, are phrases that probably follow me around on a consistent basis yeah 100 percent. how so how important are the titles to you so like why haven't you called yourself director who cares? Like, I mean, who cares about the, the who the director is, other than the person? Like, mm -hmm. I, I, like when I was in the UK and I spoke to you, I, I, I did a presentation around like who the bloody hell mm -hmm. are you, right? And it was talking about like what is what is the thing that truly matters? Yeah. Um, and I kind of challenged some of the beliefs that we have of like, oh no, it's the technology I use that like is my you know un unique differentiator or like this or that. And one of the things that I challenged was it's the it's it's the qualifications, it's the letters at the end of my name, or mm -hmm. the role within the business. I'm a director. I'm the I'm the this or the that. And I should yeah. flag that like on my LinkedIn profile it says I'm the founder and head of purpose. So theoretically, people figure that out. Um, <laughs> But my challenge is, is like, is that what makes you different? Is that what makes you unique? Is that what people yeah. are drawn to? Is that what drives well, you? It, and for me, it's it doesn't yeah. drive me that much. And yeah. I'd like to think that the general public out there go, director, great, there's a bazillion of them. What does that yeah. mean? Who the freaking heck knows? Director of an accounting firm. Boring. Um, <laughs> You're on move on. How can we like, you know, how can I actually help people to understand what it is that I actually yeah. try to achieve on a daily basis? But also... Something I'm proud about, like, yeah. like it, we've just come off ZeroCon in 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 Australia, and um, uh, Zero head of country Will Buckley did a fantastic, if not the best, keynote presentation I've seen from like an industry provider to the industry. You know, someone who's not in the industry but kind of is. It was so mm -hmm. relatable, it was so real, and he talked a lot about how as an industry we have an image problem, and it's not a physical image problem, right? It's uh, what other people think of us. Um, yeah. because of that, that creates the image problem. And I think, you know, sometimes sticking to some things like, oh, no, I must be called the director or the managing director. Yeah. Um, I think that is exacerbates it. And, like, I can, I can remember back to where I used to work before I started Illuminate uh, a number of years ago. Wow, ages ago. And they were a partnership. And then one day they're like, oh, we're not a partnership. We're down directors. Uh, and so on the front door, it was like three people's name, you know, Joe, director, Joe, director, Joe, director. And then like half a meter high was like Mark, managing director. And it was like this whole like, oh, because I'm the director. No, but I'm the managing director. It means I'm yeah. better than you. I'm more <laughs> important than you. And um, I don't know. Like, I think, I think those kind of things get in the way of what you're actually trying to achieve. I know they yeah. help to understand like, oh, what am I responsible sure, for? Yeah. But, but it gets yeah. in the way of what you're actually trying to do, right? Yeah, I have the same belief. This is why I'm called Captain is because I have a, I, that I, innate belief that I am a captain to other captains. So I'm helping them run their own ships. That, I was going to ask you that question it. today. I was like, <laughs> all right, like Captain Kelly, like, did you did you serve some stuff? Are you like, is it like yeah. Captain Crunch cereal? Like, what what are we talking here? Like, OK, it's that's cool. Okay. I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> yeah, definitely more cereal than serving. <laughs> mm. No, hmm. it's, it's just a way of me explaining what it is I do and, and what it is I deliver. Like, I believe in independence. You know, I believe that you should be the captain of your ship. So hmm. this is the meaning behind it. I, I, yes, I'm a director, but that's not what I do. That's what I am. That's, that's the paperwork side. Hmm. So I, I, I love the fact that you've explained it so eloquently because, like, 
we don't have to stick to the labels that we're given. We can be creative with them and we can just make this up because everything is made up. Everything but I, is made I think up. it helps as well though. Like when we, when we create these made up terms of what your role actually yeah. looks like, and don't get me wrong, some of them are absolutely ridiculous and stupid. And yeah. they're a way to kind of maybe make people feel better whilst they're actually potentially being mistreated. Like the number of times I've heard of, and forgive forgive me if you're out there with this title, um, but the number of times I've met people who are the director of first impressions, i.e. Oh. the front desk reception administ administrator, and they hate their jobs, but they feel like that title's been given to them to make them feel like it's okay to be mistreated okay. or, or misrepresented. Um, that I I've find really interesting. I've never heard that. Oh, well, you can you can use it now. Director of first impressions. It's like you walk, anytime someone walks in the door, you're the first person that sees them. When the phone rings, you're the one that answers the phone. And don't get me wrong, it's not wrong, but like, I don't know, yeah. it, just, it just doesn't sound genuine to me. No, so it sounds a bit cliche. A of, yeah, like a number of years ago, I sat down with, um, so there's, there's a few people in equity at Illuminate. Um, a mm. number of years ago, there was myself, and then I brought on two guys, and there's a couple of women as well. So we're great kind of team of five of us but at the point where there was three of us we kind of sat down one day and we said well how do we how do we tackle this business and we kind of broke it up into three things there's there's people mm -hmm. there's process and there's purpose yeah. so i'm 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 purpose shane process mick people and we just looked at what our strengths were and then how can we divide and conquer as a result of that? Now, we've scaled a bit more where that kind of stuff is a bit more challenging in certain elements, but it, it mm -hmm. allowed us to really focus on, all right, great, my responsibility is purpose. So I might still be involved in process of people, but I bring mm -hmm. the purpose element to that. Whereas Mick, who's people, he brings the people element to the purpose. He brings the people element to the, the, pro the, the process. And then Shane, who's process, brings the process to the other. So we kind of like try to leverage that skill set across each other rather than trying to have it all for yourself. So like when there is a party of one, one person's in charge, yep. they might struggle to be all three things because they probably have their own skill sets and they probably might not have the vision so much or yep. they might not have um they might not be as processed orientated as they as they should need to be. So mm -hmm. how does somebody balance that as a party of one? Oh I mean, I've been a party of one in that space and I think you don't realize you're not great at all of it until you're exposed to someone who yeah. is good at it. So you're yeah. like, you think, oh, actually, I'm, I'm great at process. And then I met a Shane um, yeah. and I was like, holy crap, <laughs> I am useful <laughs> at this stuff. To a point where I actually like now realize that like the way that I think about process is like, it works for me. Like, you know, you should never build a process for a few. You should build it for the many. Um, yeah. And I was always built it, not even for a few, just for the one. So I think if you're that one person environment and you're like, well, how do I divvy up those three? I think there's an element of learning and um, exposure that you try to give yourself. Mm. Um, so how do I seek out people or environments that have um, great approaches to these things? Who's really good at people? Great. How can I spend some time around that? Who's really good at process? And so you try to skill yourself up to a point. Yeah. And then depending on, yeah, depending on how much you need, I don't know. You just reach out and say, can I have a hand? What do yeah. you think about this? What does it look like? Like people in our industry, as we kind of grow through our experience and do more of what we do, like we should be supporting each other. Now mm -hmm. I feel like I'm relatively good at purpose stuff. I try to find as much opportunity to spend time with other accountants who are trying to seek and find purpose either as individuals or within their business. Yeah. I think this the um it's the whole skills gap analysis that people people mm. try to do everything at once instead of saying where are my weak points and what help do I need to get that sorted. Um so they just try and do everything and then they just do it mediocre. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's yeah, kind of like what if I you try to happens. if you try to do everything well you do nothing well. It's just yeah. un unless you're one of those exceptional humans and I do come across them every now and then I'm like why the, the hell unicorns. Yeah, right. You're you're beautiful. You're healthy. You're happy. You're good at like what the fuck? Where is the rest of the, for for all of us? Like you've taken all the good stuff. This is this is unfair. Why am I a moldy apple on the floor? <laughs> I, I'm not even a moldy one. Why am I just an apple when you're like a tree of apples? Like, damn it. <sighs> oh well, but you know, some people out there got they got to do they got to do their thing, and they do. They got to well. be them, right? They got to live to their to their strengths, and that's their strengths. So one thing you do well um, is you talk about breaking stereotypes and the image problem that you just referred to with the with the keynote speaker. 
that's something that I would like to challenge as well. Um, mm. I think you called yourself an hobo accounting. Is that right? Um, Which I love, by the way. Where did you so, Where did you hear that from? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I think I just googled you and just did some. So research. this is hilarious. Then, so uh, on Twitter, otherwise known as X now. So when I was in the UK this year um, mm. to speak at the Digital Accountancy Show. I, yeah. I spent some time uh, and was interviewed by Zero whilst I was there. And they then on Twitter, X, released an excerpt of that of me talking. And I'm, for those of you, I don't know if this is video shared or whatnot, but if, you, if you're not, if you not going to yeah. see what I look like, I have a beard. I have a nose mm-hmm. ring. I have a bunch of dumb tattoos. I have debit and credit tattoos on my hands. Like, oh, my goodness I have, me. I'm, I'm a little bit overweight, um, but I'm working on that. You know, like I wear ripped jeans. I might wear a bean. Like I... And so yeah. that's what they saw. And then a couple of trolls on there just was like, I don't ever trust this bloke. Rip jeans, baseball cap. He looks like a hobo, probably delivers. Like it was honestly for me, it was probably the most amazing yeah. evidence of what I feel like my career to date has worked on is unintentionally, like I've mm-hmm. just being me, but unintentionally it is creating an environment where people are exposed to people who can do things really well that might not look like they should be able to, but yeah. also allowing people to be more comfortable with who they are and so that they can go and do things even better because they're comfortable and they feel safe in that environment as a result of it. Yeah. I think that's one of the most underrated things about being yourself in this industry. When you go and look at business owners, they're not all sitting at their desks in grey suits you know, going to their offices nine till five, you know, picking up their pack lunch from their wife. And, you know, the traditional stereotype of business has completely changed. Yep. So that needs to be reflected in the services that are provided for them because they need that assurance that they're okay in how they perceive themselves to be. And I think the hobo accounting, the look, the, you know, the beard, the hats and all of this, just being us people, really helps them be themselves and i think that's so underrated i mean like it's this it's not marketing so like i don't i don't do what i do because i'm like oh it'll win me work <laughs> if i just like you know grow a beard and get tattoos and say stupid stuff um but, <laughs> if only it was that easy <laughs> right if only it was but I think there's a there's a there's a lesson to be learned about being authentic and then allowing yeah. your brand and your marketing to attach to that. Because um um oh Karen. Karen from the um the accountant marketer. Oh my gosh, Karen, I've I've forgotten your name, your last name. My apologies, Karen. Sorry, um, Karen. Sorry, Karen. Um it's probably not even Karen, I've gotten in a lot of trouble. <laughs> But I remember, I remember being on a on a um, a webinar with her, and I was being asked about like marketing stuff, and I'm like, I don't know, you just you know, you do this and that, like I don't, there's no real thing about it, you know, you just, you know, I was massively glossing over stuff, mm-hmm. and she's like, Andrew, I don't think you realize like great marketing divides, so you have unintentionally been authentic. And as a result of being authentic, you have created division, which is a yeah. positive thing because what it means is there is a bunch of people who are like, holy crap, I want to work with these guys. I want to work with this person. And there's a bunch of people who are like, I want to have absolutely nothing to do with that hobo. Yeah. And the good thing is, is like, great, now I don't have to work with people who don't like me. I can work with people who love and appreciate that element. And now I have way more opportunity than I ever had before because I'm not caught in the sea of gray. Yeah. I ah, oh, that's so beautiful and music to my ears. I'm a marketer myself and trying to explain that concept to accountants is really hard because they feel like they're missing out if they're too divisive or to themselves or they niche too hard. They just feel like they're going to miss out all the time. So they don't do it. They want to be generalist for everybody at all times. It doesn't work that way. Marketing simply doesn't work that way at all. Never has, nope. never will. Nope. No, no, it's 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 funny. So, um, coming off the back of Zericon, like this this whole idea of like we have an image problem and all yeah. this kind of stuff is really like sat in my mind because I'm like, well, do we and how are people interpreting what that looks like? And not externally, how are we as an accounting industry, as accountants, what are we doing about that? Because mm-hmm. are we the ones that are creating that image problem? And there's one. This is like probably my greatest pet peeve in the world of accounting industry bookkeeping maybe any industry is where they say we are not your average insert whatever it is you do we're not your average accountant we speak your language 
we're not like the others. And there's two, there's two, right? there's two reasons I hate this. One, if you have to say it, you yeah. are not it. Yeah. You are not the average. You are not what you say you yeah. are because you have to say it. You should be able to live that through your actions and yeah. the way you represent yourself, whether that's digitally or in person, it. it should show that. Yeah. People should see that. But the second thing, and this is probably what's been bugging me more post this ZeroCon thing around image and whatnot, is like if you're saying I'm not the average accountant, is that you effectively saying my industry is a, my industry is a pile of shit? but I'm yeah. better than everybody else. So you are actually dragging out your peers down and you're, mm. you're helping to contribute to this idea that we have an image problem by using that in your language and your marketing as opposed to, well, great. I know I don't want to say I'm the average accountant. I'm stoked about that. But like, what can you do to help to raise the bar of what yeah. um, people understand our industry to be and thus yeah. you don't have to use that language anymore? Yeah, oddly, I think I am an average accountant might might work better. <laughs> oh, brilliant! An average accountant, great. I know what I'm going to get. <laughs> but that's but but it's also the thing is like if we can if we can improve the understanding of what it is that we do as an industry to the eyes yeah. and the ears of the general public, then when they say, "Oh, you're an accountant," they yeah. don't immediately go, "Oh, you're an accountant." Yeah. They go, "Oh, sweet, you're an accountant. Awesome. You guys do great yeah. stuff." I just don't understand how the world hasn't gotten done to how sexy this industry is. It's so far advanced or more advanced than other industry types. There is so much more technology. There is so much more community. I mean, you go to things like ZeroCon, for goodness sake, you know, there are loads of industries and business types that don't get this type mm. of um, activity within their spheres. Like there's so It's so much better than anyone could imagine, but they don't see that because they're just tucked away in their corner. I've I've got yeah. a bit of a I've got a bit of a thought around this. Um and the thought is think of how accountants are portrayed generally whether mm. it's in, you know, the creative arts, you know, film, TV or oh, whether yeah. it's in advertisements. They are portrayed yeah. one of two ways. Boring, yeah. useless people that you don't want any to spend time with or like fucking superman. So, like, you think about, like, the accounting technologies. We're going to do an ad about work with you're an accountant and they're in a cape and they're doing these things. They're like, that is not reality. So you're, you're setting everybody else up to fail. And at the other end, they're treating us like we're useless, boring people. So the reality of who we are is not actually represented by anybody. No. And whilst, it's the archetypes. And it's like that whilst these large accounting apps are thinking that they're trying to promote and encourage the industry, I actually – think that it's doing the opposite because what it means is someone goes well my accountant isn't a wizard well my accountant doesn't like do all those kind of things and save me millions of dollars in tax so clearly my accountant must be crap and every other experience they've had suggests that is and therefore well it's just not reality and therefore they don't understand what reality is anyway that, I'm, I'm ranting so much about this we, stuff but <laughs> it's all right this is a soapbox you're allowed to be on it so we Thank you, um <laughs> This conversation about accounting apps and their advertising practices comes up quite a lot. <laughs> quite a oh, lot. That's good. That's yeah. good. Um, I want to talk to you about wellness. There was a zero report on wellness. And because mm. I wrote my notes a while ago, I really I can't remember why I wanted to speak to you about it. So you're going to have to fill me in. But it's one Absolutely. of your um, – you've got authenticity, brand, culture, wellness, and impact is the kind of values that you – support on a daily basis so what's this report about and where's the problem yeah absolutely so um i think it was around april or so give or take um zero unveiled a bunch of data around um research they've been doing into small business owner well-being and like what are these what do these numbers look like and what is it what is it telling us and so they looked at a whole bunch of different stuff it was called the global state of small business owner well-being if you are an accountant advisor or someone who's just interested, you should check this out. Mm. So over now they did a bunch of research and there's a bunch of stats, but overwhelmingly the results suggest in one, two, three, four, five, six out of seven regions. So they looked at the US, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, Canada, South Africa, and Singapore. So in those seven regions, six of those regions, overwhelmingly small business owners said that they had a lower satisfaction, life satisfaction, than what the general public was saying. 
mm. a lower life satisfaction. Now, that's I'm not saying they had a lower quality of life. Maybe they had more money, maybe they're not, but they were less happy with what it is that they had, less happy with various different pieces. And the one that was the outlier was South Africa, and I think potentially emerging economies. So there's like, if you're a business owner, you might have a fair bit more to be happy about. I don't know. Mm. I haven't spent time in South Africa yet. If you're in South Africa, invite me over. Come hang out. <laughs> but the worst country was the United Kingdom, dramatically <laughs> worse than the general public, followed by Australia. And you oh. look at that and you go, wow. Like, yeah. Now, we can probably throw out half a dozen reasons why a small business owner doesn't like their life anywhere as much. They've got to deal with people. They've got cash flow challenges. Um, you know, it's mainly stressful. our government. I'm fairly sure it's mainly our government. <laughs> <laughs> but working long, working long hours, all this kind of stuff. Like I, I don't know about you, but I've never been a business owner that said, you know what? I think I'm going to start a business so that I can be depressed and not make any money. That's what. Oh I want yeah, to that's do. the whole reason I started. <laughs> but for whatever reason, that's what they're feeling. And yeah. so when I came over to the UK this year, um, what I was sharing at the Digital Accountancy Show, which was rad, by the way. Was, was what can was we as accountants do to impact that? Because mm -hmm. I believe that we're actually in an exceptionally good position to help to improve those numbers. Mm -hmm. We have conversations with our clients on a consistent basis, whether that is unintentional or structured, we are constantly yeah. communicating with them. So I talked a lot about how can we utilize like Maslow hierarchy of need, right? You know, so yeah. we're not going to worry about food, shelter, water, sex. That's, that's the bit that hopefully is already taken care of. But what can we do to build some security? You know, what can we do to get some self-esteem? How can we make them feel like they belong through the conversations we have? And so I challenged those um, in attendance and said, well, think about the questions you ask. You know, the idea of ask more questions than you answer. How can yeah. we ask more questions that allow our clients to think more about that situation so that they can start to unpack that? And if we can guide our questions around that help to bring up more, more, a better sense of security, belonging, and self esteem, yeah. then maybe, just maybe, they might make better decisions. They might feel like they're in control more and their satisfaction in life might actually yeah. improve. So, this is super interesting. There are, and if we look at the staff within a practice, they're not trained to talk to clients outside of their scope of work. Mm -hmm. right? And they, they get nervous that, and I'm generalizing. So if this is not you, they're like just generalizing, just from what I've seen. So they get nervous about talking to their clients and they think that they have to be the answer to the questions that they ask. So they don't ask open questions that they can't answer. They don't ask questions that might be leading them into something that they don't understand because they think that they have to be the solution provider for everything. And that's mm. a scary place. That's untrodden waters. So how how do you get around that fear? Yeah, it's it's such an interesting one, right? And I, like I I asked, I put a shout out on LinkedIn before I kind of I spoke on the topic, and like why why are we not doing that? And there's you know people mm. are saying, well, you know, not qualified to do so. People yep. saying, you know, that's not our place. We should it's be not doing our that. Some people saying, oh, well, you know, profitability, you need to make sure you're getting paid for the stuff you do. Like and a, a lot of valid questions. But like I think, like you said, is there's a, there's a fear element. We are afraid to have conversations like that. Yeah. And I can 100%, 100% relate. But the number of times I've asked a question and gone, uh oh, because I can see the way the facial reaction of the person I've just asked it. I'm like, this is about to be a very deep long and potentially uncomfortable conversation because mm. this person's about to like uncork a whole bunch of stress and yeah. like cry about something or like share about yeah. frustrations yeah. and like and like i remember this time i had this client and just getting to know them really and we were talking about some stuff and an investment they made and it didn't quite go well or whatever and he kind of glazed over it and he kind of uh, and i'm like and i stopped and i said do you mind are you okay about that and he just he lost it, and he's like, "I feel yeah. like, I feel like I've, I'm I'm a horrible husband, a father. Or, you know, I was responsible for this stuff, and I made this decision, and it didn't work, and rah rah rah." I'm like, "Yeah," and like, there's there was no answer. It wasn't like, "Oh, you're not a horrible father or husband." Because I don't know who maybe he is. I don't know that, but like, 
just allowing, allowing it to them out. to get that out and get it out and go, cool. Thank you for sharing that. Like I'm here to try and ensure that you don't feel like you're making the bad decisions going forward. Let's work together on that stuff. So I don't know what the answer is other than how do we become more comfortable asking questions? And so there, there is a handful of stuff that you potentially could look to do to try and improve upon that. But I think the first thing is simply being open, being open and being comfortable with silence Ooh, and being yeah, comfortable with one. asking a question that you wouldn't ordinarily ask yeah. purely with the idea of, I would like to see what this answer might be because this could be yeah. important. I'm going to let you answer it, not me. Yeah. I think in, in the big scheme of things, it's as simple as having a conversation with your best friend. You have their best interests at heart. You don't want to solve everything that they're going through, but you just want them to be in the safest place possible. That's, that's the, in the picture. But that yeah. is a really hard thing to do, especially when you're in problem-solving mode. And you're like, no, totally. I have to deliver, deliver, deliver. Uh, to yeah, but I have a job to do. I've got things that I'm paid for. And it's like, yeah. uh, and, and I fully respect, like, I, you know, I've lodged many a tax return and done many a, you know, GST, that for you guys. And I've done that. But like, that's not necessarily what the client's looking for. Yeah. They want to run a better business. They want to make a better decision. They want to like those are the actions we take. But like, and so I think if we're 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 in this space and we're going, well, what can I do to get that, that little bit better? I think three things. Firstly, is you got to be curious, you got to be yeah. purposeful, and you have to be brave. Yeah. And all three of those are hard. How do I be curious without sounding like I'm a moron? How do I be purposeful without pushing More an intrusive. agenda? <laughs> and how do I be brave when I feel scared about this conversation? Yeah. And then I think once you go through that, we can start looking at other things like how do you become a good listener? So being comfortable with silence, being comfortable with not sharing. I say it as I'm talking all the bloody time to you. <laughs> how do you this, how, this is your stage. <laughs> <laughs> but how do you how do we get to a point where we don't fear our questions that we're gonna ask? Yeah. I'd be brave, understand what questions is it that I could, you know, I've got a bag. And I, I'm, I got a bag. I can pull this one out because I feel like this is right for this moment, and I'm comfortable to ask that. Yeah. And do your research. Uh, who are you talking to right now, and yeah. what? And, why? Why might you ask those questions? And talk about it internally. Like you don't yep. have to give war and peace about it. You don't have to give any personal details about it. But talk about what relationships you've got with your own clients or the clients you look after or the problems that they're coming up against. Because your teammates are probably going to have a perspective on that that's going to help you. Like just be yep. open. Let's get conversation flowing. And I think in terms of like the, you know, be curious mm. is go where the conversation takes you. Yeah. Like we often feel like, well, I don't know, I have to move to this next thing. And every yeah. time I'll meet with a client, the first thing I'll ask them is like, hey, we're about to go through a bunch of stuff today. But before I start, before I go anywhere, what is the one thing that you want to walk away with today to ensure that this was valuable? And they'll mm -hmm. tell me what that one thing is. and go, great, I'm going to note that down. And at some point in our conversation, we will get there. And if we yeah. don't get there with five minutes left, I'm going to halt our conversation and I'll go there. But I don't want to like immediately go there and potentially ruin this conversation that's going to happen. Yeah. Allow it to go where it needs to go. Oh. Because then you now, might that's find the conversation so that I like. Yeah, that's the conversation I like having. Some people were going to feel petrified with the, with the insecurity of where that could lead to. Like that's, but I'm going to have to stop this there because our conversation, I feel could probably go on all day for me and all night for you. Mm -hmm. There is mm -hmm. one final question I've got for you that Please. you have to answer. Okay. What is the sexiest thing about accountants? So this is a, this, oh, this is an interesting <laughs> question, right? <laughs> I, I recently spent some time with a, a govern, governing body and an organization that's trying to help to promote to school leavers and whatnot a career in accounting. Mm -hmm. And they're like, we want, a peop we want them to understand that accounting is sexy. We want them to see that accounting is sexy. And I said, it's not. It's not. Like, like we, there's nothing that you can do to convince someone who is not interested in accounting that it is sexy. Mm. It's not. So, but what can we do to help them show them that it is not, not sexy? So, how, so, which is probably not the answer that you were hoping for right now. <laughs> 
Like, I don't think it's a sexy industry, but I think the people within it, our authenticity and the way we go about yeah. things is what makes it sexy. So how do we do that? How do we make that real? And then people can start to see that, oh, hold on a second. You're not an accountant. You're Andrew who happens to do accounting. And I think that is when beauty comes out of what we do. The accounting is your vehicle to make the impact that you want. Totally, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Totally. Right. You have been an absolute delight. So thank you very much for coming on. I um, can't believe it's been so long we've been chatting. I feel like it's been two minutes. Thanks for I having know, me on. Right? <laughs> Time just disappears. I, I was going to make these um, these podcasts 20 minutes, but I like talking, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> I could go for another hour or three if you really want to. We'll just take this thing <laughs> offline. It'll be great. Yeah. Well, next time I'm going to get you on again and we'll go through some other stuff. But as I say, you've been a delight. I'm going to post a, a link to your LinkedIn channel, which I believe is one of your main ones. Yeah, LinkedIn is the best way to get in touch with me. I do have a uh, a personal website, andrewvandebeek.com.au, um, or you can jump on uh, illuminate.com.au, which is the accounting firm I run down here in uh, in Australia and check us out. Australia. Amazing. Right, mate. <laughs> I really shouldn't do accents. I keep telling myself. <laughs> right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop it there before I get myself in trouble. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for being my guest. And I will see you next week.